Well, hello there, Broncos country, and it's once again time for another episode of Building the Broncos. I'm your host, Carl Dummler, and of course, joining me once again, Mr. Nick Kendall. Nick, how you doing, buddy? Hey, doing pretty well. I don't want to offend anybody. I know that we're in a Yankees emblem here today. I'm not a Yankee fan. I'm actually a St. Louis Cardinal fan, which might be more hurtful to people listening to this because I mean, the Cardinals have kind of been some of the more annoying teams, I guess, in the NL for the last you know 20 years because they've been good, but... I like to go to a bunch of stadiums, and I got this one when I went to Yankee Stadium, gosh, years ago. So don't be offended. This is a Bronco podcast. You're at the right spot. For sure. Uh, yeah, you and I, we that's one thing we've bonded over is our, our love of baseball and, of course, the Cardinals and, uh, and of course, then the Broncos. And so I, I'm with you. It's been fun to go to different stadiums. I think one of my favorites actually is Coors Stadium. There, there's not a bad Coors seat field. in the place. Or, yeah, Coors Stadium, Coors Field. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm, I'm a baseball fan. Yeah, cool. I've been there a few times. I've been to a few games at yeah. uh, Coors Field. I think it's now already like the second or third oldest stadium in the National League, though, because just like how many teams have started yeah. to build stadiums over the past. I mean, obviously, Wrigley's older, but I think it might be Coors Field that's the next. So crazy how much those uh, those things change. Yeah, it doesn't take too long to go from best stadium to, to worst stadium. Arms race. Yeah. Well, I mean, San Diego used to get Super Bowls. And now they don't even have a team. Thanks. <laughs> Whoops. Thanks. But uh, anyway, let's get to some football conversation. But before we do that, I want to let you know, Twitter, you can find us. You can find me at Carl Dumbler MHH and Nick at Nick Kindle MHH. And make sure you follow the podcast Twitter account at BTB Football Pod. And make sure you subscribe to our show wherever you listen to podcasts and, and leave us a rating if you can. Also, uh, don't miss out on all of our great off-season content going on at milehighhuddle.com of the Maven Coalition and Sports Illustrated. There's lots going on, uh, lots of different conversations. I know John Elway and Vic Fangio did interviews today, so lots of things coming out. Make sure you are being kept up on everything going on and know that this podcast is powered by Overtime Media. All right. Uh, good to, to see everybody getting in here for the show. Yeah, hey, I should tweet and- it out. I feel, feel like... Chad, if you're watching, I wish you guys would do that when we do that. But uh, yeah, no, it's great to have everybody in here, get a little bit of normalcy. We see Terry Randall in here, Buana Beast, Ian Garrett, Cody Chippel, uh, Mohammed Badri. So, I mean, a bunch of uh, familiar faces in here. Sterling, D- Sterling Donovan, Matthew Olivo, Shane Schaefer, Corey Linton, a bunch of faces that we've seen before. Brian Greenfield, Bronx legend as well. Really good to see all you guys joining us today on, uh, gosh, what is it, Tuesday? With all this yeah. stuff going on, I, I don't even count the days anymore. It's it's day. And that yeah. means it's uh, <laughs> days that end in Y, am I right? I'm, yeah. I figured I'd use the upgrade to a, a better glass here for my uh, my beverage choice. So now it's up to your imagination, but uh, you can probably think a little bit. Uh, <laughs> anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know what's going on. Where, do you have your drink? Was that all I, talk? I couldn't find uh, some Coke. So uh, I was going to have some uh some whiskey and coke and uh couldn't find it today uh, not a yankees fan no, sorry guys it's just, i just like sports and i got paraphernalia from the stadiums i go to so i even own a cubs hat and i absolutely despise the cubs but i get one from every single stadium i go to I just want to finish that collection before i die so um, and i know it's not zima but on a beast <laughs> yeah C- cubs would be uh buried in my closet or burned one of the two yeah so sorry for any Cubs fans that are joining us here. I hope I hope you don't want to leave. But uh, I do see a, I got a theology question <laughs> from the Simpsons. <laughs> could Jesus microwave a burrito so hot that he himself could not eat it? No. That's my answer. I'll keep it short and simple. I beat the devil in a fiddle contest once. No, That's kidding. impressive. <laughs> you are uh, a fiddler player. I am a fiddler. I played the devil went down to Georgia seventh grade talent show. Good, good time. <laughs> Uh, and I still play it in my mom's band from time to time after she has to go get a uh, adult beverage refill. So I'll go up there and play. But anyway, topic at hand today, we're talking about the Broncos secondary, uh, what they can still do to improve it. Um, oh, we got a super chat here from Brian Greenfield as well. Hello again, Brian. Still working. Uh, working is overrated. Well, you know, when you are coming here and talking football with you guys, it doesn't re- really feel like work. So uh Oh man, the, people are really hating the ink. I knew I really thought about changing it, but I just you know, <laughs> go change. I'll 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 t- I'll cover us for here a couple seconds here. Also, we were talking about Derek Jeter, and I really respect the game from Derek Jeter, and it has nothing to do with baseball. He's just an F. Abs- <laughs> he's a great player. We'll leave that up to your imagination. Yeah, we'll leave that. Yep, exactly. But anyway, Broncos secondary today. 
what is the Broncos secondary still lacking? Obviously they have one of the better safety duos in football. Uh, they have Justin Simmons who was tagged, should have a contract coming up, hopefully before the regular season kicks off. Also, we are going to see Kareem Jackson back a signing last year that I think at this point last year, we probably both thought Kareem Jackson was going to play cornerback. Is that incorrect to say? I think we thought Chris Harris Jr. and Kareem Jackson. So, we, we thought he would be, I mean, kind of the hybrid that would be moving all over the roster. Because, I mean, that's which what he still he did. kind of was. So was right. I mean, that's right. the safeties in the scheme. There's a lot of match quarters going on, a lot of uh, versatility in the back end. Yeah, he, he did that a lot at, at Houston. So I thought that he would be doing that here. And, and like I said, he did do some of that, but he still played a lot more safety than he ever did cornerback this past season. Some of that. I, I really appreciated that the Broncos decided to stick to their guns on what his role was going to be. Yeah. That even when the injury started happening, they just said, Nope, this is the best place for him. We don't want to lose talent at this spot to sacrifice, to add talent to this other spot. And so I always really appreciated that. And uh, it does seem like the Broncos are, are hoping this year. It's a little bit more retooled there in the secondary. I mean, Vic Fangio, he did say he wants to play six defensive backs on a lot more snaps this year. And so this is why it is such a big conversation. I, I think it's being one of the least talked about that should be talked about for the Broncos. I know a lot of people want to talk offensive line. A lot of people want to talk wide receiver and, and that's understandable, but it, it's still, there's more to this picture. And, and if, if the Broncos pass rush, that's looking really strong with interior and exterior pass rushers. Exterior. It, it, well, I'll call them exterior, <laughs> edge players, whatever you want to call them. They're coming uh, from the sideline. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if we get Brown, he can make plays from the sideline. That's true. I'll, I'll That's true. That. But uh, but no, it, it is. It's one of those where you still got to have a pretty good secondary. And, and they did some plug and play guys last year that did okay at times. But it yeah. was easy to see that they were they just weren't up to, to par. And I mean, we got a shout out to that, guys like Isaac Yadam. Uh, Devontae Harris, Duke Dawson, and uh, Devontae Bosby, who is back. But I'm sorry, those guys, none of those guys played at a level that you want to do talking as far as cornerback two, cornerback three. That's, I mean, that's just the simple fact of it. It does sound like, again, hearing through the grapevine, that Isaac Yadam and Duke Dawson will be battling for kind of a safety cornerback hybrid spot, kind of what Will Parks was last season. So that's an interesting development. We'll see if that holds true. Obviously, things can change after the draft, especially. Um, but right now the Broncos, they seem to be okay on their one and two cornerback and their one and two safety, but that third cornerback, that third safety, both things that this defense, I mean, listening to Fangio, watching them try to go up against a team like the chiefs, you need that depth in the secondary. And right now, I mean, Will Parks is gone. Your third safety is Devonte Bosby who flashed, but I mean, it was like one and a half games. Devonte Harris looked okay in one and a half games and then absolutely fell off a cliff. So mm -hmm. how much can you count on that? It's just, it's a bigger area of need than many people realize at this point. Right, right. And, and so I, I do think that's going to be a position the Broncos focus on. Uh, we have Ron W coming in here with the super chat. Really appreciate it. And Thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah, and your smile's bringing a smile to my face, man. You've appreciate got a good it. Smile. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which cornerback, free agent, or draft would you like coming to Denver? Uh, Who's your man. favorite draft cornerback? Not just number one, but somebody that you like their style. Say a day two cornerback specifically. Okay. Uh, Jalen Johnson. Okay. I, I really uh -huh. like his click and close. I think he is he's not close to his ceiling. I think there's still a lot of room to grow. You saw growth throughout his college career. I think he's coming from a great coaching situation there in Utah, but they've been able to produce a lot of great defensive players to the NFL. And, and I just think that he could be a guy that fits really well into the system. Even year one, he's still going to make some mistakes because, I mean, he made some mistakes there in Utah didn't always have the greatest technique, but when he was locked in, that was a guy that I really like. And he has size. He has decent speed. He's not the fastest guy by any means, but uh, he's, he's a, a willing tackler, which is something I know somebody asked earlier about. Uh, I can't remember who asked it earlier, but something about uh, CJ Henderson. And is he a willing tackler? Well, this last year he wasn't the, the two years before that, he was a much better tackler than this last season. So you have to decide, was that him making business decisions or was that something that's going to continue into his NFL career? I get major uh, Dominique Roger Camardi's vibe watching him, you know, big long guy. He shouldn't be as fast or as fluid as he is, but when it comes time to do the dirty work, to be physical, to come in and fill that, you know, the D gap up that alley just doesn't do it. 
not not at the rate that you want, but massive upside, massive length. If you want a guy to leave there on the island, I like the tools. I just, yeah, gosh, for Denver's scheme, if they would have been playing this Wade Phillips team or the scheme still, where you know you have much more pressure and much more guys on an island, cover one safety kind of going on, I could see Henderson then. But in this one, you're going to put guys in situations where they have to tackle. It's just I don't love the scheme that even though there's a very solid chance that maybe he has the overall best player available when the Broncos are on the board at 15 and maybe they swing on that upside. I mean, either you can cover, or you can Vic Fangio said that on his end of the year presser. So he's yeah. an interesting one, massive upside, massive tools, but I just don't love the, the fit for the scheme. It just, it scares me a bit. And I don't like soft players. I think defense is as much, you know, bring in a mentality as it is anything else. Granted, I grew up being the world's biggest Bill Romanowski fan. So I like guys who are absolute jerks on the defensive side of the ball. I'll just yeah. admit it. Uh, my guy round two that I really like is uh, I'm going to totally blow the name here, but Noah Igba, Igba Nanahi, uh from uh, Auburn. He's a former wide receiver player. Doesn't have the best ball skills, but you watch him play. He's so smooth. He's pretty darn long. He's not the tallest guy, but he has a 32 inch arm length. He ran a uh, four, four, seven, 40 off the top of my head there. Don't quote me on that one. I know it was a pretty good for you. He's below four or five. And I really like watching his tape at Auburn this year. He was a guy actually shout out to a friend of mine, Alex Gade. We were watching the Auburn Minnesota game, uh, the bowl game. And they were talking again, shout out also Todd McShay saying this Auburn cornerback, you know, a guy that NFL teams really like. And I'm like, I haven't heard or watched of any Auburn quarterbacks this year. Folks did on that guy. And he had a really good game hitting him against Rashad Bateman, who's going to be a really good wide, wide receiver coming out of Minnesota next year. So I'm going to pr- miss or butcher this name again, but Noah Igbenanahi from Auburn is a guy day two that if he's there at pick 46, I would be a huge fan of him. I like him a lot. Yeah. I wanted to get this in here. Justin, really appreciate it that, that you've been such a big fan of the, the show and a huge supporter. Uh, let's start it off. Hashtag Nick's Beer Fund. Hashtag Carl DeMann. I'll take it. I like it. I like it. Really appreciate everything, guys, and uh, keep getting in everything as we go through this. Uh, we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can, especially uh, today about the cornerback. Uh, I know I'll see some here about – Yeah, and safety. Yeah, don't don't forget about that safety position. We'll be talking about that here a little bit. But Brian Greenfield coming in here with the super chat. Really appreciate it. And uh, asked uh, or says, uh, I think with our front four should make the secondary a lot better wide receiver should have a good pass rush. And without that, it doesn't matter how good the corners are. Uh, it's all synergy. I mean, you can't have a great pass rush without great cover. You can't have great coverage without great pass rush. You need both. I, I mean, it really, I, it's, it's tandem. It all flows yeah. into itself. I think of the, the Raiders game with Isaac Yadam. It didn't matter how great the pass rush was. His guy was open every single time because Yadam, the, the first one, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> the the very first one. Yeah. He, he just got used and abused. I mean, it was, he was playing 10 yards off and I think he was just scared that he was going to get beat deep. So he just decided I'm going to keep everything in front of me. And the Raiders like, hey, you're going to give us that kind of cushion. We'll take 10 yards every single time. And I don't know if he has the, the loosest hips or the best clicking clothes to play this game. I feel like he's a guy who, if you have him up at the line of scrimmage and he can use his length and physicality to disrupt, you can get away with it a little bit. Granted, you need to get pressure and have some help behind him. But if you're asking him to be more read, react off coverage and, you know, have those hips be loose, have him react to where the ball's going or where the route's coming. That's just not his, his best skill set. So that's right. probably a reason that they're moving him more to a, a safety position where you're not having to ask him to turn his hips, having to have that reaction as much. He can be much more methodical and use that physicality of the, the alley, which I mean, right. Yadam, but Yadam is a really good special teams player. He's a good tackler. Maybe this is a good fit for him. Yeah. I, I just, I'm more trying to point towards the idea that it doesn't matter if your pass rush is great. If your cornerbacks, if they, if they play that kind of off coverage and now you could say that's a little bit of coaching too, but it also is kind of the trying to protect yourself from getting beat deep. I mean, a lot of coaches are very risk adverse. Uh, Bill Belichick, that's one that he's made an entire career about being one of the smartest guys on the field because he just doesn't make mistakes. He coaches up a team that doesn't make mistakes. They win a lot of games because other teams mess up, not because they actually beat the other team. It's just the other team beat themselves. And, and again, so if you don't have the talent to, to trust that they're going to hold up for that three seconds for your pass rush to get home, that makes it very, very difficult. And so that's why we're talking about the cornerback need for this team that, uh, I mean, I hope Callahan's healthy. We'll, we'll see. I mean, even if he is healthy, he hasn't finished an entire season yet. He hasn't played an entire 16 games. 
So yeah. I still don't think you can trust him. Even if he plays 12 games, that's great. But I still can't see him playing every single game of the year. And and behind uh, uh, Bouye and and Callahan, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a lot of question marks. I mean, Bosby had a couple of nice games. I saw a couple of people mention his name here in the in the comments, and and so he has some upside. But, but a very low floor. Right. Exactly. And if we're talking about Yadam, if we're talking about uh, some of these other guys, Duke Dawson, um, yeah, it, right. There, there's just there's a lot of question marks there of guys that are pretty average. So it's a group that would be definitely good to add to. Uh, Bronx legend, Bronx legend. There we go. Coming in, he he didn't mind your New York Yankees. Yeah, I guess maybe this is the Bronx that he's talking about. Maybe it's yeah. short for Broncos. But uh, <laughs> if you are in the Bronx area, thinking about you guys, I know that's being very heavily hit. Yeah. Um, but, uh, anyway, that, yeah, just, um, yeah, he is in Bronx, New York. I see in the questions, he says, well, what you guys think of Murray in the second? Um, in the second round, if you're talking Kenneth Murray in the second round, that's a great get that's value 46. I've seen most people talking about Kenneth Murray at 15 overall, and I don't love that value, but if you can get him round two, him or Patrick queen round two, that's a heck of a get. So yeah. I like, I actually, Kenneth Murray, I think, is a guy with a much higher floor. I think he brings a lot of that tenacity you want. But I have questions about his ability and coverage. You know, we saw with Devin Bush last year, great athlete. Great athlete does not mean great coverage player. There's yep. some technique there. There's some looseness in the hips. There's some intelligence that you got to have. And you just haven't seen that with him. So Did, did you see uh, the Broncos' first release of highlights from Melvin Gordon? Did no, you see it, those? No, was it, it, it was him. It was him stiff, stiff arming Devin Bush. Okay. Well, and, that's, uh, that's probably I, I thought that was, uh, pretty fitting. <laughs> There's a reason they put that in there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, if, if one of those linebackers falls to the second round, that's great value for the Broncos. It gives them a guy that could step in, play it at different times, different roles within the, the defense while also having a little time to develop because I mean, that, that's kind of the thing about the linebackers in this draft is they, they're not NFL ready. Yeah. There's a lot of questions to things of just that you can see on tape of times where they really get themselves out of position. And while their athleticism covers that up some in, in college, like you said, that doesn't always translate then to the NFL and yep. teams will take advantage to that. So they, they could have a time to, to kind of think through some of that, but uh, all right, Terry Randall coming in. Hope you brought an extra one this time, brother. <laughs> Uh -oh. Hashtag Nick's beer fun. Uh, what late round cornerback should we keep an eye on? Do you have any for a shout out? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think right now. Uh, I got, I got go some on the top of my hand. Okay. Right. Well, I said that on purpose because Harrison hand from temple, uh, six foot about 195 pounds. He actually is a guy who tested extremely well. Not a lot of people are talking about him, but this is another uh, Matt Rule recruited player for Temple there. Obviously went to Baylor, now is on at the, the head coach of the Carolina Panthers, but he's a guy that's very underrated. I also really like uh, Kendall Vildor, a small guy, uh, not the, I mean, he's 5'10", 185, but man, he's feisty. He did pretty darn good in the post uh, season pre-draft cycle. I like him a fair amount as well. And uh, Reggie Robinson is an interesting one from Tulsa. That I like a fair amount. So some smaller school guys there, but there's some interesting smaller school cornerbacks. Yeah, there there are um, others that I think really late round guys. Stanford Samuels, Florida State, got some athleticism that he could be a nice developmental player yeah. to, to add to the list. Uh, some guys from like the Senior Bowl, like a staying uh, Bassey of Wake Forest. Yes, he's a one that's interesting as well. That's kind of being slept on. Right, Troy Pride is another. Uh, depending, I mean, I've seen round go, three, <laughs> right? Yeah, it, it kind of depends on where you see these guys going in the draft, but th there's a few names out there that uh, Michael Ojemudia from Iowa tested pretty darn well. Long he reminds me a little bit of Isaac Yannam, but I feel like he's more comfortable in zone than uh, Yannam was. Yeah, I, I saw him mock to the Broncos in the third round the other day. I mean, he's big, he's long, he's got he's a good tackler. And he's another one that was a wide receiver convert. So I always done a pretty good job over the recent years in developing defensive backs. So I mean, he, he brand what a straight up four or five at six foot, 200 pounds. That's pretty darn good. So yeah. he, he's borderline round three, round four kind of guy. Yeah. Can't disagree there. Um, so I guess I got to ask you, here's, we're talking cornerbacks here. There's some questions obviously going on here, but out of the top guys, is there anybody that you are 
you know, let's say round one through round three that you personally would pass on. So somebody that you feel is slightly overrated that you just wouldn't touch. Um, I'm going to go first because you stole mine guy last time. So okay. you can think about it this time. Okay, so go ahead. Still my guy. Mine is Damon Arnett. I really liked him early on. And, you know, when he was playing opposite of Jeffrey Okuda and Sean Wade, Wade there in the slot, who I'm still a little bit sad didn't come out. Honestly, if he would have come out, we might be talking about him at 15, but that's, you know, Maybe 2021 we'll be talking about him, but Damon Arnett, cornerback for Ohio State. I liked him this season, but he has really had a rough go of it in the pre-draft cycle. He did not test the best. Obviously, tape matters most, but he did not test the best, which in a solid day two cornerback class, that's enough of a differentiator for me where I'm just, it makes me a little apprehensive, but also he's going to be 24 years old this season, so he's older for a player. And which is not good. I mean, that's not great for Garrett Bowles, but it's even more important for a position like wide receiver, running back, quarterback, cornerback, because the the drop off is sooner than it is for offensive line and for well, for quarterback. You're minimizing that that window, but for cornerback especially, 24 years old, not good. And then there are just ample ample off field concerns with him. So there's there's way too much smoke. I know that he kind of fired back at some of it in the. the senior bowl cycle, if I recall correctly, but there's multiple people from multiple sources saying this guy has character issues. So that's enough for me being older, bad uh, pre-draft cycle. And now the, uh, also the poor character reportedly that scares me. So I'm going to pass on David Arnett. Okay. I'm going to go Bryce Hall. Uh Uh-oh, careful. Andrew Jackson here. I saw him asking about him a few times already. So he's a big, uh, he's a big Bryce Hall fan. I don't mind him. Just the, the injury scares me. The speed concerns scare me. I mean, the, the fact that we're not getting to see some of his, his physical testing this offseason is what really makes me nervous for a player like him. I, I think that's why you could see him drop because there are rumors yeah. that he was going to be like a 4 6 40 kind of cornerback. And a 4 6 40, I'm sorry, that is not going to, that's not going to go well. <laughs> and especially in the AFC West where you got some real speed. That, that could be coming, especially if the if the Raiders take Henry Ruggs, which is a real possibility, or even Jerry Judy. I mean, uh, whoever they take. And um, so I, I just that, that's why I just have so many concerns about him moving forward. Um, I, I like the player. I like a lot of the tape that you see. I do think he's a pretty good scheme fit because he's better zone than he is man and, and coverage. But you still need to be able to play man coverage. You still need to be able to take a guy down the field and stick with him. He's long. He's strong. He has a lot of good traits, but th- there's just some missing pieces there that make me very nervous. Yep. I agree with you there. So, and I, I want to ask you about one too. My other guy that I just, I don't know what to think of him is Cameron Dantzler from Mississippi state. He's a guy that I've seen him on the ground way too, way too often than what you yep. should see. He's a tall cornerback without being long which is concerning. I mean, that's his center of gravity is, I mean, he's, what is he? Six one, but he has short arms and uh, also, but then at the same time, his game against Jamar chase and LSU was by far the best anybody played against Jamar chase this entire season. So like, I don't know what to make of him. So my, my thought is a one game sample size is a very dangerous thing to get based on, you know, for potential Uh, the Broncos back in 2007, fell in love with a defensive end from, from Florida that they traded up for. And I can't remember his name off the top of my head. It'll be in the comments here in two seconds. I know. Thank you guys. I really appreciate that you guys are always on top of this, but uh, he had a great bowl game. I think he had like two or three sacks and just really, I mean, then he blew up the combine, had some really great numbers, always looked good in, in shorts, but when it actually came to the game, he was nothing. And it just always, that always stuck oh, with me. Jarvis Moss. Oh man. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I remember you, I added him in Madden where he was a God. Yeah. He had like a 20 sack season. <laughs> yes. Okay. Jarvis Moss. Thank you guys. I, I, I can always count Wanna on beast. you guys. Thank you very much. Um, and so that, that's why I always really worry about that one game sample size when, when there's other games that you're looking at and other samples that you're going, man, that guy did not show up against other competition. And, and so that's why, yes, I, I would have some major questions. I, I mean, he has potential, obviously. Yeah. I mean, potential scary though. Yeah. <laughs> that, but you're yeah, drafting guys for potential, right? So they, it is what it is. Uh, a couple of shout-outs um, here. Bronx oh, yeah, just, also. Right. Uh, 
Ned Ludlow, really appreciate the the donation here. With the Mecklenburg uh, jersey as well. Man. Killing it. There we go. I just did a, a Broncos, um, what was it? Uh, Mount Rushmore of defensive players. That was one of my guys right there. Mm. And uh, Bronx came in with another one. Really appreciate it. So I just want to let you guys know, we really appreciate everything that you guys do. How yeah, you keep you so us, uh, keep names for me accountable. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I need that because sometimes Nick gets stumped too by my, my descriptions. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so otherwise, another one I do question just a little bit just because of upside, Christian Fulton. Broncos did meet or did meet with him or are about to meet with him. Yeah. So they're going to have and a FaceTime with him. I like his game. I just don't love it. it. It doesn't make me think number one cornerback that you can really build a defense around. And if I'm taking a guy at 15 for the defense right now, that's what I'm looking for. That's why I have CJ Henderson higher than him is because I feel like CJ Henderson has that potential to actually be a true number one cornerback in the NFL. Uh, man, if you rank any of Christian Fulton, CJ Henderson, and Jeff Gladney, two, three, or four, I'm not going to argue with you. Yeah. You know, any of those guys, I feel like they're the same tier for me. So I'd be I'd be happiest to take the last of them, if that makes sense. So if there's like a trade down or a trade up, and you can get any of those guys, I'd be happy with them. I do agree with you about Fulton's potential to be, be a number one versus a number two is questionable. He did play this last season with an injury, which that's admirable of him. And I thought his 2018 tape was better than last year, so... That's yeah. that's a question for him. Maybe that'll make him fall, but I think right. he's he was tasked. LSU had put a lot on their plate for the cornerbacks, and obviously yeah. Stingley is the guy with amazing tools. He'll be a top ten pick in two years, but I think Fulton is still a really good cornerback. So I'd have no issue with him at fifteen. Not my favorite, but if they're picking twenty to thirty, I would have zero issue with Christian Fulton. Cornerback, defensive line, wide receiver, offensive tackle. That's one of those positions. It's a it's a meat grinder. You just need to continually invest in capital there. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to have issues. So. That's my thought on him. I saw a couple other questions here. There's some other cornerbacks. I'll just toss them out here. Have you had a chance to watch much Darnay Holmes? I, I've watched a couple of his games. And, and not him, too- he's another one that was kind of up and down. I felt like yeah. UCLA, once the season was obviously over, he kind of packed it up. But in the, I believe it was the Senior Bowl, maybe it was the Shrine game, he was reportedly doing pretty darn well and has a, while on the field, he's not always the most physical, but he's a he's a chirper, which I tend to appreciate. A guy who likes to get in the offensive, the wide receiver's face and let him know when they made a play. Yeah, I, I like this one uh, from Buana. Ebenezer Ekebon played better than Moss. <laughs> yes, that was one of the bigger draft busts of Broncos history. Yes. Was Jarvis Moss. And that, that was a sad one because, yeah, when, when they made the pick, that was when I was really starting to get into the draft. And I just remember watching a few of his games going, man, why are they taking this guy? He looks like maybe like a fifth round kind of player. And uh, I'm, it's one of those now I can sit there and say, I'm glad I was right. But at the time, I'm like, man, I'm glad I'm, I was really mad that I was right on, on him. Uh, Brian Greenfield coming in. We'll, we'll get to your other name here. I just wanted to get to his uh, coming in with another super chat. I hope Ruggs goes to the Raiders. That will sure seal my bus prediction on him. I mean, where guys land is half the battle. I mean, you can look at Sam Darnold is a great example. Obviously, quarterback matters a lot, but he had a heck of a lot of talent coming out and obviously still has talent. But two years now with the tr- trash Jets organization, they look worse on paper than they did a year ago. And here we are. I mean, are we on high alert right now for Sam Darnold? I mean, is he about to be a bust because the situation is so bad? Well, I mean, th- there might not be a worst wide receiver room in the NFL. They have Crowder. They have a Nunwa. That's pretty, pretty darn bad. Yeah, and oh, they signed. Uh, they signed Perryman as well. Still, well, yeah. I mean, it's not great. It's not great. Right. I knew they had somebody else. Right, right. But and this I have is a question why for you. What's I, better? Let's say that Perryman's their number one. Who's a better two and three? A Nunwa and Crowder, or Hamilton and Patrick? Obviously Sutton makes it that the Broncos are way better and also right. they have Fant as well. But like I, I would probably take what the Jets have. Yeah, I think I agree. But granted, Sutton is the major skill tipper there because he's right. so much better. He's a borderline yeah. top ten wide receiver. But Tim Patrick here's, and Deshaun Hamilton are not good. For here's what I will three. say about Ruggs going to the Raiders. If they stick with Derek Carr, that is a bad pick for them. Yeah. Derek Carr <laughs> is risk averse, especially after his 
all of his injuries, he does not want to throw down the field. I mean, the, there are guys running open down the field and he'll check down to his running back almost every time. Uh, his first read, if it's a deep read, he'll look at it for a second and then go straight to his safety valve. And, and this is why I do think that you're hearing a lot more rumors about the Raiders moving on at quarterback. I mean, all John four Gruden, of these top quarterbacks are interesting. If I was, if we didn't have Drew Locke, I would be banging the table just to take a swing. Yeah. I mean, Jordan Love and Justin Herbert are not getting the love that they probably should just because the upside. I understand their risk, but like, and I'm also changing my opinion. The farther we get out, obviously knowing who Paxton Lynch was in hindsight is different. Total dingus. That's being nice. I'm not going to curse on the pod, but um, we'll try not to. No promises. We'll see yeah. how many of these I can get down. But um, <laughs> that's uh, taking a swing at quarterback is just something you have to do. If you don't have it, you're screwed. So you have to take swings. So and that's why I have no issue. With, I mean, Drew Locke last year, some people didn't like the pick. I'd have been fine with him at 10. Obviously, you got him in the second round. That's better, but you got to take swings. Otherwise, you're sunk. Yeah. No, but like, like I said, I, I just think that there's a lot of a lot of smoke to to the fact that Carr <laughs> could be gone. Uh, yeah. that I, I, I'm guessing he still gets 2020, but I think 2021, it, like I said, wouldn't be surprised if Jordan Love is their guy. Um, that could be a team a, that moves up for Tua. If the injury stuff is going on, there's a lot of smoke in regards to Tua's injuries yeah. coming from people. Granted, I think it might be the Chargers in the end that take him. Maybe they bring on like somebody like Cam Newton and move on to two in a year. Jameis Winston and Cam Newton are still out there. Those are viable quarterback options. Andy Dalton might get moved. So there's still some quarterback movement that's going to happen. Right. How these four play out is going to be really interesting. I don't think Jordan it Love is. is getting enough. But there's there's more NFL love for him than there is media love right now. Right. I, I do know, yeah, from a pretty re- reliable source, the Raiders do like him. They also like another quarterback that has not been listed. Jalen Hurts. Yes. So – they. If they decide to go ahead and get like wide receivers in the first round, then get a guy like Jalen Hurts to to pair with them. Just some some thoughts there, some things to kind of keep an eye on of what the Raiders might be doing. Okay, uh, I gotta call Jody out here though. Nick, was I okay with the Lynch pick? I absolutely hated the Lynch pick at the time. If you can go back and find my stuff, then I wasn't on Twitter then, but I I was head over heels with Chris Jones. I was full on, and this was before he tore open his crotch around the forty. You know, I, I and, full on Mississippi State Chris <laughs> Chris Jones infatuation, and also I really loved uh, Dak Prescott. Yep. So the guys that I wanted to come out I, of that draft, my favorites were Dak Prescott, Chris Jones, and Justin Simmons. I, I so, can vouch for that. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is why we made the bets that I lost. Obviously, uh, I, I was a fan of Lynch. I thought that those physical tools they could develop him into something, and it's just, and I still think if he had the mind to actually put himself. To work or the heart. Yep. Well, yeah, th- those two things. I mean, for a quarterback, that that is more important than you think. I mean, arm talent is great, but arm talent really only gets you so far. I mean, th- that's why you see so many of these guys uh, that, that that bust that have great arms but can't do it. And then you got guys like uh, like I mean, Tom Brady didn't have the greatest arm in the world. Peyton Manning didn't have the greatest arm in the world. Drew Brees does not have the greatest arm in the world, but those guys are smart. They are driven. They put in the work to become great. And yep. that's what it takes to make it as a great elite quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. And uh, so I want, wanted to get Paul in here. Paul, our man. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Love Bronco talk. Hashtag keep the beer flowing where the beer flows like wine. That's what I always think. Uh, I did see a really interesting question here from Cody Chepa. Really appreciate it. Uh, do you think we can trade back in the first to take a top center and then take a receiver in the second round? Possible. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, today. Everything's possible right. at this point. Well, and and I would say they, they did talk to Vic Fangio today, and they asked him about where Glasgow's going to play. And he said right now they're looking at him as a guard. And so that does mean center is still a position of need. And they had their first official online visit over FaceTime. And it was uh, one of my favorite centers in the class in Matt Hennessy. Yep. So yeah. I, I do think that they're looking at center. We'll, we'll see what part of the draft they're willing to look at center. It depends on how the board falls. Right. And, and I think they like Pat that, Morris enough where if they went next year with him at center, they could live with that. Yeah. Or do some rearranging. But that's, I mean, it's not their, probably their favorite option. Maybe they'd like to bring in somebody, some competition, maybe a better talent there, but they can live with it. And I think that's an important distinguishing factor. Right. 
Um, but yeah, if they if they trade back, the the hard part always is finding a trading partner. Uh, that that's where maybe if a a Jordan Love happened to fall in the draft, maybe that's where the Broncos could get some quality uh, draft capital. Maybe the the Patriots sit there and say, "Oh man, we got to go get our quarterback because we don't have one." Uh, I mean Hoyer, I'm sorry that that's not going to end well. Stidham, it's going to be Jared Stidham, baby. Oh, I like man. Stidham. I like Stidham coming out. He was my non round one quarterback last year. There you go. But uh, yes, so yeah, there's some some options there. And and if the Broncos, this is the thing. I, I know this argument broke out on Twitter earlier today. We were talking about it in our uh, group chat that we have on Facebook. Of um, there are some that are never receiver in the first round people out there. And, and because we argue with them, people think, Oh, you think that we have to take wide receiver in the first round? No, that's not the case. Broncos can wait to the second, third, probably not further than the third round for wide receiver. I mean, it's deep, but it's not that deep. Um, so the, the, they can wait. It, it's just the quality drops off with each round. Yeah. And, and also can, not only the quality, but like, your, you need to look at prospects as like air bars, you know, like where, where they can be is that high variance. And if you got a guy in the first round, typically you're going to have obviously the more higher upside, but also typically also that floor is going to be higher as well. So you're just, you're adding more risk on that hit. You know, it's like playing a, a scratch chicken instead of a, you know, high wind chance penny, penny slot or something. I'm not a right. gambler. Obviously you can tell terrible gambling <laughs> analogies, but um that's the biggest thing. So if they, if one of the best wide receivers is there at 15, it makes sense. Obviously we should get back yep. to secondary here, but um, that's just because not only is it a long-term need, but a immediate need as well. So, yep. uh, but if the best player on the board is an offensive tackle, if the best player on the board is an interior defensive lineman, then screw it. You know, trust the board. You have f- six other rounds. You have four other top 100 picks and those Draft picks, I mean, they're investments. They're not about the year one return. They're about what you're going to get three years from now, what you're hopefully going to get eight years from now. So, right. you, you know, you need to look at it beyond what's up the upcoming season. That being said, the white receiver still makes sense. Yep. Uh, but um, I did see, again, Jody's saying, bring it up, Nick. I did see that it was Todd McShay just had the Broncos taking Andrew Thomas at 15 and then KJ Hamler at 46. Won't lie, I wouldn't be the happiest with that pick. I'm a little bit concerned with KJ Hamler's catch radius, everything like that. And I think Andrew Thomas, because he's a solid guy, I think he's going to be one of the best of them year one. But he's better, he's best at run blocking. I am, I'm drafting, I'm building a team to be a passing team. It's just the most efficient way to build a team in today's NFL. So that's what I'm about. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. We got back to the secondary from Chris Sanders. Thanks for getting us back on track. Appreciate it here, and, and of course coming in with the donation as well. Uh, Delpit at 15 or Chin Bur- Burgess in round three. Safety is the need no one is talking about. Uh, about or a boot. A, a? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, man. I'm, I'm terrible. I almost spit out my beer. I know. Hashtag proud of Canadian, as you should be. Uh, hashtag Nick's Canadian beer fund. There we go. See, now you got to get some. Oh gosh, I can't even think of a Canadian beer. Um, there's a blue one with a moose on it. I can't even remember. <laughs> uh, okay, so answering the first part of this, Delpit at fifteen. No, I, I I'd be pretty upset about that. That's not, not that. It, Delpit I think has some pretty high upside. You look at his 2018 tip t- tape, and and there's a lot of these guys in the secondary. Their 2018 tape was actually better than their 2019, and so you got to kind of decide where do they fit. Uh, you you kind of worry about them not growing every year in college. Have they reached their ceiling? Was one year uh, too much hype kind of thing? Uh, all those things play into it. But uh, but Delpit, I, I wouldn't mind if he's there in the second round for the Broncos, but at 15, I just can't see the value in that. Now, Chen, Burgess in round three? Yes, please. Chen in, in the second round. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's something that should be – I do know – I, I, that he's, I think he's pretty high on the Broncos board. I think he's a guy that fits their defense very well. He has versatile ability to play all over the field. Uh, there, there's just, he's got size, he's got speed, he's got power. He's got a willingness to step, step in, make a tackle. He's got about everything that you're looking for at the safety position. And, and Burgess, I know that's a guy that you've liked quite a bit as well. I love Burgess. Yeah. Uh, from, he's been one of my Utah. favorites. He's, he's, I mean, he's Will Parks. 
is exactly what he is. He's a yeah. really good slot player. He can play that too high set, but where he's best is you're letting him use that ability in that slot coming down, being that third safety. So he's a better, I think he's a better version of Will Parks. And speaking of Will Parks, I was looking at his snap count the other day. Let me see if I can pull this up here real quick. I was making a, a point, but you know, Will Parks is listed as a safety, but last year from weeks 13 to 17 in the slot position, specifically, he played 45 snaps from slot week 13, 44 week 14, 40 week 15, 30 week 16, and 50 week 50 week 17. So Will Parks, while he's a safety, his position, his usage in this defense ended up being a slot, essentially. I mean, they replaced Duke Dawson for Will Parks, and the defensive secondary got better. So yep. that's a position looking for a safety that can play that slot position. I think that's where you see Jeremiah Chin play. He played cornerback and linebacker and safety at SIU. <laughs> so he's a very versatile player. Granted, when you're playing that level of football, you're, and you're that athletic. You can pretty much do anything. But um, I would love Chin in round two. And for me, he's playing not only safety. He's the Kareem Jackson replacement in the future, but he's in the immediate, immediate day one replacement for Will Parks in those slot snaps where he's kind of that – almost kind of a hybrid safety nickel slash will linebacker. I mean, essentially he's what I would use Isaiah Simmons, the diet Isaiah Simmons role. Yeah. All right. Paul coming in with another question here. Uh, do you think draft day trades will be harder or easier the way things are for this draft? I know it's a dumb question. Blame it on isolation and no sports hashtag. I have no March madness. Man, believe I have me, Paul, no I, idea. I believe me. I understand my, my, uh, my college team, KU, Number one team in the country don't get to have their their tournament, so I, I'm very very saddened. I thought they should have just handed the trophy to him. So hey, the I, I, I agree to that. If you give Luca Garza the best player award, the Naismith Award, I'll, I'm we, fine, fine. He's it's yours. <laughs> no, March Madden or NCAA. I hope you're listening. There you go. We just solved everything for you. Uh, I do think they'll be harder. Yeah. I think when anytime you get technology involved instead of being face to face or having guys in a room working like that, uh, it, it adds a lot of complication to it. And, you know, a lot of these guys aren't even going to be able to be in the same room of you're talking maybe John Elway working from his house, Vic Fangio working from his house. I'm guessing they're going to probably have a room where they're going to give everybody six feet of, of space between each other and they're going to have about three or four guys. Like but a you're just tall at a hotel. Right you're still you're still not going to have the number of guys that you usually do. And so you're not going to have the communication quite there as you did before. I know the NFL, they actually talked about um, giving teams one round or one one pick where they can extend time a couple extra minutes to be able to get a trade done uh, just to kind of help negate some of this. I know they've talked about maybe making the draft like five days long. So the teams have a little bit more time to work and, and do some things. So I, I do think that they're talking right now, trying to figure out how to help with this issue because trades are a big part of the draft. I mean, it's, it's the excitement of it. You, you see that uh, little cursor come across the bottom and says trade coming in. Bum, 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 bum. Yep. Da -da -dum, bum, bum. The Broncos it, it's, are uh, Yeah, exactly. It's, it's an exciting thing and they don't want to lose that. So I, I do think. I remember last year out freaking something. out after they made Dalton Reisner and all of a sudden trade happened and it flashed and it's like the Broncos traded the Broncos traded after taking <laughs> Reisner it's lock it's yep. gotta be locked man that, I was I was way too excited for that yeah no um, that, was, that was a pretty exciting time but talking about safeties here is there any other safeties that are worth talking about I mean obviously Chin is a guy that we both like a lot um I, I'm a big fan of the, what's his gosh Burgess uh yep. but is there any other safeties that are interesting to you uh Antoine Winfield Okay. Although I do feel like he's His a little injuries. bit more, yeah, and I feel like he's more of that uh, that free safety roamer than he is a replacement for what Kareem Jackson brings to the table. Uh, Xavier McKinney obviously is a name that needs to come up because he can play all over the defense. It would surprise me if the Broncos trade back in the first round and took him. Uh, yeah. Kyle Duggar, Duggar is another one that deserves some some talk. Uh, Ashton Davis of California. Another one with injuries that's a little older. I yeah. can see this, the injury factor with this draft because of everything that's going on is going to be wild. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see Levis Gushnall fall to day three because of that. Yeah. So uh, somebody that I feel like is rising that is interesting is uh, Alohai Gilman from Notre Dame. He played very well at the Senior Bowl, a guy that I think it was Ted Ugian that we had on here. Who did we have to talk? 
from that. I think it was Ted Nugian who works for the athletic, but he brought up uh, Aloha Gilman as a guy to watch coming out of the senior bowl that really impressed him a lot. So some interesting players there for the safety position, but you know, I think the big two, the Broncos are kind of looking for that safety linebacker nickel hybrid and Jeremy Chin, who's 22 years old or Kyle Duggar, who's 24, both guys that are really interesting. Grant Delpit, not my favorite, good player in 2018, concerned about his, his exact fit. But if he's there at 46, I mean, you know, we can talk then, but not at 15. Man, you, you were so close. Wannabes, blue moose beer. You close. even said it, it's a blue can that has a moose on it. <laughs> it tastes like beer. That's what concerns me. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> or moose drool. I don't know. Moose head lager. That's another, that's, I think that's the one I was talking about. Oh, okay. Bo's All Natural. I've, I've had that one before. I've never heard of Creamore Springs Brewery. Moose head lager. I've heard of that one. Uh, Chris Sanders came in for you. He's got some names if you want to look at those in the in the comments. But uh, uh, also, yes, th this does – it's kind of a nice nostalgia thing with Jeremy Chin, but he is Atwater's nephew. And so the fact that we could get two Atwaters that have played safety at a high level for the Broncos would be very nice to, to have there. And uh, I'm sure Atwood would – or Atwater would be very excited to be able to talk about his um, – Nephew. Yeah. And oh, hashtag fake news. Sorry. Moosehead. Is the go-to? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I like to drink okay. local when I can help it. So, but definitely, I'm I'm, in, I'm a hophead. Anything with hops, I I'm, I will give it a shot. Um, I know I see Tina Fairchild here saying intrigued with Tanner Muse in the later rounds. He's an interesting one. I thought that he just scares me because he tested really well. Uh, same with Caleb on Wallace. I think, but Muse is the guy who tested extremely well, but it just never matched up in the tape. You know, it's kind of that. Uh, you know, who was an incredible athlete coming out of college that the Broncos took in the fourth round and never really worked for him as a defensive player, but as a special teamer, he was dy dynamic. And that was a uh, David Bruton, absolute freak athlete, killed yep. the combine jumps, runs stiff player, not always the best at seeing things, but gosh, darn what a special teams player. So, yep. I mean, th there's, there's a role for those kind of guys. Yep. And I've seen a couple people bill coming in here uh, with, would you either of you take chin in round two in a heartbeat? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw on the, uh, on Twitter, on the, the Twitter sphere, uh, Nick and I did a, a community mock draft, which is pretty much you got 31 other GMs that represent each team. And uh, we, we took Jeremy Chin in the third. Now we were really debating taking him in the second. Like he was, we had three names. We had Blacklock. We had Ezra Cleveland. Got to say the schools and the positions. Maybe these people don't know. Okay. Blacklock, defensive line. TCU. Uh, Yes, TCU. You got Cleveland from Boise playing offensive tackle, and and then Chin safety from SIU, and we we ended up going defensive line. Now this was before the Broncos signed um, Shelby, Shelby Harris, Harris back to the Broncos, but at the same time you still can't have enough defensive linemen, and and so we ended up going with Blacklock. But Chin was, he's probably second on my list. Cleveland was third, <laughs> and. End up making it to the third round for us. But uh, yes, so that would be one that uh, I, I would highly recommend keeping an eye on for the Broncos because it is a huge position of need. Something they used, like a lot, you said a lot with Bill, Will Parks last year, they're needing some replacement for that. Yeah, that's definitely a great call. I, so, and Duggar, I mean, same kind of thing. Similar, similar player, probably a little bit better year one, less projection, but yeah. less of an athlete and two years older, which, I mean, 24 year old rookie. That's, you know, it's not the worst, but if you can get a 22 year old one, you should take the guy who's two years younger. Yeah. If they're close. Now this, this is a great question when we're talking about secondary kind of giving you an idea of players to be looking for uh, from Robert Caslow. Really appreciate this. Uh, does the Fangio defense use zone more than man coverage? I saw somebody say they just turned on and saw the Yankees. Did I am at the wrong place? No, you're not at the wrong place. It's just a, uh, Sticking at home, hashtag, you know, distancing. And uh, this is just what I put on today, folks. So, uh, so sorry. Um, be soon, right? <laughs> man, I should have put on my Cardinals one. I just I just grabbed a shirt, folks. I, I get it. Souvenirs everywhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, definitely. The Fangio does tend to use more zone, but he uses both. I mean, every you have to play some sort of man at this point in today's NFL, otherwise you're going to get beat. So he uses a little bit of both, a lot of match quarters. Uh, tries to confuse guys rolling over coverages. It, it's right. It's much more complicated than what you see on Madden with like the cover two, the cover three, cover two right. man, et cetera. 
right? One, one of the unique things that he does is play a what's pretty much a zone man, where they start out in zone, and then when somebody comes into your zone, you switch over to man coverage. And this is a way to have your eyes on the quarterback for the first couple seconds and then switch over to man where all of a sudden you got tighter coverage as you go. Uh, what I mean, it's taken some risk in doing that because if two guys flood a zone, you got to pick which one you're going to cover, and it means probably one of them is going to be open. But at the same time, it is a, a nice way to really confuse quarterbacks, and it's why when – I can't remember who they were asking, but uh, Vic Fangio's name came up as the best defensive coordinator in all of football t- from every single player that was interviewed. And and so – Is that good? The, I, I think so. <laughs> there we go. Carl gets the full $5 due to that awful shirt. <laughs> No more Nick's beer fun. That's fine. Yep. Yep. Sorry, man. That's what happens when you wear Yankees. You have to remember. It's Jeter, man. Last week I wore an EMT shirt. I don't know if anybody noticed, but I was walking out the door and my wife goes, Carl, you shouldn't wear that. People are going to ask a lot of questions. It's like, yeah, they don't care. (laughs) I'm getting more crap about this. Um, I saw somebody ask about any linebackers. Uh, Somebody asked about Akeem Davis Gaither, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any day two linebackers that, have your heart, you know, somebody that interests you specifically? Well, yeah, uh, there's uh, – Troy Dye would be a nice one. Where at? Not round two. Or round two? Well, okay, you, you said day two. I know, but uh, that could be round two. That could be round three. Specifically. Oh. Okay, well, he'd be round three for me. Uh, I don't think any of these guys that I really like fall to to round two. It's hard for I, me to see Kenneth Murray or Patrick Queen falling to the second round. And I wouldn't take any other ones round two at 46. Right. I agree with you. So round after three. you get past that, then like the third and fourth round is where I'm really looking at linebacker. That's where you get your Akeem Davis Gaither, your Logan Wilson, Jordan Brooks, uh, Evan Weaver, Troy Dye. Th- th- those are a lot of the guys that begin to show up. Willie Gay is another one I've seen a couple people mention that I would really like for the Broncos. Malik uh, Harrison. Yep, Malik Harrison. That's one of my favorites. Davian Taylor is another name to throw out there from Colorado. I'm sure you guys probably know him maybe even better than we know him. Uh, really late rounds. You got Francis Bernard is a guy that I know you were really high on for a long time. D.D. Harding is an interesting player as well from Illinois. Uh Obviously, you got the the guys from Miami, uh, Shaquille Quarterman. But I mean, you you can always take uh, flyers late. A guy day three that I really like. Injury concerns is kind of the Jake Butt flyer. But if you're using a fifth round pick, honestly, it looks bad in hindsight. But it's a fifth round pick. I mean, come on, that's that's the point of it. You're taking flyers at that point. Yep. Um, but uh, yes, the the guy that I, I'm interested in in regards to the Jake Butt flyer is Marcus Bailey from Purdue. Had multiple knee injuries, but when he played, he was a top fifty pick. I mean, he was really good and. You know, you're playing with house money. You have some extra picks. If you let's say you keep them, if you want to roll the dice on Marcus Bailey in the fifth round, then by all means, you know, otherwise you're getting a, you know, you're either taking a risk on a Marcus Bailey or you're drafting a Keyshawn B area. Yeah. Who cares? I mean, that's, that's, that's a late day three pick. And, and Bill is right. This is what I was talking about. It wasn't players. It was coaches, mm-hmm. offensive coaches talking about who's the toughest defense coordinator they faced. And McVeigh, LaFleur, and Kyle Shanahan all said Vic Fangio. So when it's coming from some of the best offensive coordinators in football, that should cause you to sit up in your seat and say, we got a good one there. Now, whether he's a great head coach, that's still left out there. Question. We'll, well, we'll see as we, we go through this. Uh, but, uh, you know, year one, ups and downs, as you'd expect from a first-year head coach. Yeah. And Wayne here. Uh, Nick, you're a Broncos fan and a St. Louis Cardinal fan. Did we just become best friends, stepbrothers? Well, uh, good news, Wayne. You're amongst friends here. Carl is also yep. a St. Louis Cardinal fan. So <laughs> I know there's a lot of Rocky right. fans here. I got some Rocky stuff too. I pull for the Rockies. They're my NL team or my second NL team. Yeah. But uh, I just, I don't know. I just like baseball teams. I like the whole experience. I like to go to baseball games. So I'll soak it in wherever I can go. Like I said, I even have a Cubs hat and I hate the Cubs. I hate the Cubs. <laughs> I, I hate the Cubs as much as I like a team in baseball, honest to God. But <laughs> that's, yep. I'm just a hater. So. Nope. I've, I've been to, I've actually been to more Cardinals games than I've been to Broncos games and I live closer to Denver than I do St. Louis, but I also had a roommate that had season tickets. So I've been to the World Series three times. Oh man. Look at you. Had to, had to one up me, didn't you? 
<laughs> Jody giving me a hard time. I like baseball teams. What can I say? Also, I, I like Colorado in general. Kind of like I would say the Buffs are probably my second college football team. So just pull up for Colorado there. But obviously Hawkeyes number one. Um, and I would love to come to Toronto and watch a uh, a baseball game up there. That would be beautiful. I've never been to Toronto, but it looks like a beautiful town. So guys, we don't have very much long left. We got to get out of here pretty soon. If you have any questions, make sure you get them to us. But Carl, I guess before we get out of here, you know, the biggest concern for you on this team, oh, we got to go raise. What? I didn't even know they had people crazy up in here. No, I see the nice hat there. My idol hat. Way to go, George Vandermark. Uh, good for you being a Rays fan. That's that's one thing, man. Baseball, if you are a fan of a team that's in the AL East, that's not the Yankees or the Red Sox, it's got to be a hard life. It just is, It's like being a fan of Indiana in the Big Ten. You just get rolled over by Ohio State every single year. <laughs> but um, So biggest thing for me with this defense – Broncos could look to go safety or cornerback year one. What I do like, though, is something that they're showing right now. There are a good number of cornerbacks left on this market. You know, you have Logan Ryan still. You have Dequars uh, Dennard. You have Prince Mukamara. There's some other names out there where the Broncos, if they get a cornerback, you know, round two, maybe they trade around end of round one, somewhere else round two, round three, then they don't have to go out there and get a cornerback from the free agency market. But there are still some names out there where they can bring in a guy who can be a third fourth option at cornerback of injury strike, give some depth that would provide some, some real uh, options for them. Yeah. All right. couple last questions here. Uh, Bill coming in. Do either of you think it's very likely Denver moves up for rugs? I think it's possible. I, I think it's, I, I would say it's very likely that they move up for a wide receiver, whether that's rugs or one of the other ones we'll, we'll see. But, uh, but it does seem like that the Broncos have set themselves up where wide receiver is that one glaring need on the on the roster. I mean, th- there's other needs, don't get me wrong, but that's that one spot that you're just sitting there saying, of course, there's not a starter there yet. And, and so I think the Broncos have the draft capital to be aggressive. Uh, one of our own guys there, Bob, at, at Mile High Huddle, he just did an article showing the Broncos roster. I think we're at 78 players signed on the roster right now of the 90. And so the, there's just not a lot left. And, and so th- they're going to have to do some maneuvering here in the draft. So definitely makes some sense there. Um, and oh, then and Cody- also Dre was released. Uh, Dre Kirkpatrick was released by the Bengals as well. I see Nico Perda Kakis brought that up. So a good call as well. That's another interesting name. Yeah. Do you guys have any sleeper picks for a guy on the roster who hasn't produced, who has a chance to blow up next season? Great off season question. Yep. Um, let me think about that for a second. Carl. I'm going to let you go first. Cause this time I get a ponder. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to let me let me think here as well. Give me a second. Um, Draymond Jones. Draymond Jones is the guy who I wouldn't be even surprised if he took Shelby Harris's starting snaps. You know, that's kind of the the role there. Maybe Shelby Harris gets more of a base look or that one technique in sub packages. And we saw flashes from Jones last year, but I really think Draymond Jones could be a guy who steps up this year. And we're like, wow, that's a that's a really good player. So yeah. that's the one that I'm I'm going to say I wouldn't be shocked at all if he sh- stepped up and showed up. Okay. Well, I- I'm going to go even though I'm saying cornerback is a need. I do think Bosby. Okay. He he showed that little bit of of promise there in those couple games, and I think I loved him before he played those games. I I thought he was a great fit with the system when I watched him there in the was it CFL. Or whatever, whatever he played in, AF, um, uh, AFL, AFL. There you go. I thought he was a perfect fit just watching him from that because he's aggressive. He's got that click and close ability to come down, make plays, and and so getting him here in Denver, I thought he could really be that guy that stepped up and became a, a quality starter, not a not an all star or anything like that, but a quality starter for the Broncos. And in a couple games, he showed he could be a playmaker for this defense. And uh, so he, he'd be a guy I do think can prove himself well for this next year. Absolutely. Well, anything else in the stream that you want to get to before we get going? No, I, I just like, I, I'm glad AF. we got the AF. AF. There we go. Thank you guys. See, man, this is why I love this. You guys so are we the get to, I can just yeah. talk. <laughs> you guys can correct me on stuff. AAF American allegiance or what? Somebody else tell me while I get the outro here. But uh, you guys can find Carl on Twitter at Carl Dumbler MHH and myself at Nick Kendall MHH. Make sure you head on over to Mile High Huddle, an affiliate of the Maven Coalition the and Sports Illustrated. I've posted a few articles this week. Make sure you go check them out. Also, shout out to my wife. I know it's the end of the podcast here. People will be getting out of here pretty soon, but she successfully defended her 
oral dissertation today. So a few more hurdles before she's officially, officially a doctor, a graduate here, but uh, going to pass from the University of Iowa College of Public Health with her master's in epidemiology. So really proud of her. That was a, a long time coming today. Uh, make sure you guys follow the Building the Broncos podcast and all our other great audio content by subscribing to the Huddle Up podcast. Wherever you listen to these shows, you can follow us on Twitter at Mile High Huddle and at BTB Football Pod. Uh, for Carl, I'm Nick wrapping up another episode of the Building the Broncos podcast. Carl, anything you want to touch on before we get out of here? Uh, just another one here from Terry. Appreciate it. Appreciate all of you guys. And I uh, can't wait to talk next week. Oh, man. We got a shout out here from Nico for pronouncing the name right. See, every once in a while we're going to get it. And don't congrats me. I'm just lucky to be married to my amazing wife who's probably listening in the door right behind me, making sure that I'm saying everything correct. But it's no, bonus, po- bonus points. Bonus points. I mean, she deserved it. She worked so incredibly hard. So yep. I'm, really, I'm really proud of her. Um, so, yep, that's uh, that's amazing. So thank you guys very much. Uh, until next time, we'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place. Go Broncos.